I came to Nebraska a long time ago from Boston, Massachusetts, where I had lived during my school years. I am a graduate of Boston University, where I studied with the poet Robert Lowell and was lucky to do so. And then I was the assistant director of Planned Parenthood, the Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts, at the time when John Rock was doing basic research on the birth control pill. And he had research clinics in a city that was still governed by the blue laws, which prohibited a physician from prescribing birth control to a woman. And we were working under those legal constraints. It was a very exciting time to be there. But I was a writer at that time, as well as uh, a Planned Parenthood person. What I said, that I studied with the great poet Robert Lowell at a time just after he'd won the Pulitzer Prize for his very formal verse. And at the time when he was writing Life Studies, which really changed contemporary American poetry, he gave up formal pro prosody in favor of a very personally based and direct and open free verse. And the fact that I was there in his seminar meant all the world to me and to my work. It was in that seminar that both Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plath had studied, although some years before, not that many years before, I had studied there. And in a time when in Boston, many of the great women poets like Elizabeth Bishop and um, uh, Plath and Sexton were working, Adrienne Rich, uh, in that place. My mother, who lived still in Rochester, New York, where I was raised in upstate New York, said when I told her I was moving to Nebraska, uh, I'll send you food packages. I mean, it, it, that's how provincial we were at that point in the East. But the minute we drove into Nebraska and I drove to the horizon, I fell in love with Nebraska. There is a peacefulness here in the sky and the land and that flat area. Of course, the Bohemian Alps, I learned very quickly that Nebraska is not all flat. But I did love at that time and still do love the horizon and what Keith Jacobs Hagen teaches us to see in the sky. Um, yes, I have been deeply influenced by the Nebraska landscape and by my fellow poets and colleagues at the University of Nebraska. The poets that I read for Prairie Schooner, I'm the editor of Prairie Schooner, and also the director of the Prairie Schooner Book Prizes in poetry and in short fiction. The poets I read who are writing now are probably the most direct influence on my own writing. I have, uh, most editors have a real passion for voyeurism. They love to know more and more and more. And I have an ear for the sound of spoken language. So these things affect me deeply. The poet Amy Clampett, who sent her work to Prairie Schooner early in her career, which was not so early in her life, uh, worked for the Audubon Society. And she had an amazing ear. And I would read those envelopes in my office when I was really not editing Prairie Schooner, but just much uh, different level mm -hmm. and read those poems and hear them. And those things affected my, the sound of my, of my poems. I love working with Grace Bauer, who is my colleague at the University of Nebraska. Her wit inspires me. Of course, Ted Kuser's compression, which I'm always pushing against, <laughs> has influenced me. What I discovered and what most poets and writers know is that there is a kind of flow that comes when you're doing the work, but that flow can't come unless you have some time of silence. I have a very close friend, the poet Carol Simmons Oles, and I called her one day when I had been on leave from the university, a faculty development leave to write a new book. And I said, I'm, I'm doing nothing. I'm sitting and looking out the window. I'm not reading the paper. I'm not reading. I'm just looking out the window. She said, you're doing your work. And that kind of meditative silence 
seems to be necessary. Or other times I'll be driving my car and I'll hear a phrase on the radio, just four words together, and they'll catch my attention for the sonic qualities, and then I'm off. But more often than not, I need um, not the crazy schedule that you and I both have with our work, our professional work. Mine is at the university, teaching in the graduate program and, and some undergraduates. Um, in our PhD and master's program in creative writing in the English department and editing Prairie Schooner. So most of the time I'm looking outward at other people's work rather than inward at my own. I believe that all good writing comes from the body and by that I mean the perfectly obvious address to the five senses. I also believe with Robert Lowell who wrote, yet why not say what happened? So I believe in um, history articulated through one voice, and that voice may sometimes be the voice of the poet or the voice of the writer, or it may be a, a stolen, appropriated, taken from someone else. Maybe it's a speech that you've just read and there are phrases in the speech. But for the most part, the individual voice is the one that captures me most. It captures my attention both as a reader and as a writer. Um, the voice, my voice is inconsistent. I think I'm a good editor because I have weak boundaries. I fall into a text. I don't hang on to my personal identity and, and, and beliefs. I, I can see many things from many sides, many perspectives, which makes life a little difficult for a citizen but often is helpful to a writer. Um, I think I like the voice that sounds in the moment. Um, it's very rarely my own voice as I speak to others. And more often it's a voice that I'm mimicking. Read, write, don't ever let anything silence you. Don't ever let the silence overtake you. Write, read, write, send your work out. I know from many years of editing a major journal that editors are waiting to see your work. You may not feel that that's so when you, there's so many writers, so much competition, but I don't think of it as a competition. I think of it as an ever expanding field. And now with the web, we have more and more and more opportunities to speak to one another in ways that are not this way, person to person, and, and, to, and to speak to a wide variety of audiences is really our charge. Mm -hmm. Do it, do it, do it. I have a new book of poems um, that is about two-thirds finished called List and Story which is based on some research that the poet Alicia Ostriker did. Um, she's also a scholar, and, and she wrote uh, that the Bible is comprised of lists and stories. And by lists, she meant the genealogies, the begats, and then narratives. So I thought that's what I would like to do. I'd write, like to write a book of lists and stories, catalog poems, which I love, and, and narrative stories. And so I had to leave a faculty development leave last year and I started that book and it's about two-thirds through and I'm hoping very much that Wesleyan University Press, uh, it's been my my publisher for my last four books of, of poems, um, will be interested in this one. And then after that I'd like to write one more book and that's a prose book on transitions. I've, I've written a book about disruptions in the in the body, in the body of the family, in the body politic. Now I want to write about transitions, those transitions that come in every life and that are often silent. And whether that will be an edited book in which I will commission essays from other writers or whether I'll write the essays myself, I don't know. Well, I, this may be my um, last or nearly last reading, poetry reading, in the Heritage Room and even in Lincoln, Nebraska. And so I thought I would close the reading with some few poems from List and Story. Now, it's my practice 
when I'm writing a book to let the poems occupy their space on the page, to be mapped in a certain way, but not necessarily finished. And I thought, what a great chance to read some of these poems out loud. And then I thought I would revisit um, some of my earlier books. The University of Nebraska Press has just published my first book of poems that was commissioned or was in under contract to Grove Press many many years ago when Grove Press was sold and the new owners cut out the poetry series so that manuscript fell into two pieces each of which was published but the press said let's bring them together again in under the title what happens which was the Grove Press book title and let's just do it so that book has just been published I thought I'd read some of those very early poems revisit some of them and, uh, and move through to my most recent book of poems, which is called All Odd and Splendid. My name is Meredith McGowan, and I am the curator of the Heritage Room. I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room and to the John H. James Reading Series. We're excited that this reading series has been in existence for 25 years. Um, the Ames reading is obviously currently held at 2 o'clock here on the third Sunday of the month, and I thank you for being here. This is the 190th reading in the series, so I'm glad you're here to enjoy it. We are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. It is a special collection dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. It is a representative collection, of course, of about... 13,000 volumes, um, some, uh, some 3,000 Nebraska authors. We also have information files, magazines, pictures, manuscripts. Um, if you look around the room, you'll see artwork, um, owls carved by John, John's guard, and those kinds of things too, and other memorabilia. And by the way, the Heritage Room is not tax supported. It's supported by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. So we'd like to thank the NLHA for the endowment that they established through their volunteer efforts um, a number of years ago. We also invite you to visit the Heritage Room when we're open for regular public service hours. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3 and on Sundays from 2 to 5. So we did just open the room and you're here to um, to enjoy the program today. Um, the Ames readings are also filmed by Five City TV. And if you're watching the program on Five City TV and you're not in the Heritage Room, I just thought I'd mention that we are on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library, 14th and N in downtown Lincoln. Well, our reader today is Hilda Raz. Now, Hilda is no stranger to the Heritage Room. She's been a great supporter over the years of this room. She's read several times in the past, and it really did seem appropriate to include her this year in the 25th year of the Ames Reading Series. She is a New York native, was educated at Boston University, and in about 1963, she moved to Nebraska. She's a professor of English and women's gender and gender studies at UNL, and she's also the editor of the Prairie Schooner. And I believe she's done that since about 1987. Her numerous writings have been published in books and journals, and her two most recent works are All Odd and Splendid, published by Wesleyan University Press in 2008, and What Happens from Bison Books, University of Nebraska Press, 2009. And she also just told me that she had received news of an award, the Stanley Lindbergh Award for Editing Excellence, which is uh, will, we, will be formally presented in Seattle in August of this year. So that's pretty exciting. We are really happy to have Hilda with us today, and I hope you'll please help me welcome her to you. Thanks to Meredith McGowan and the Heritage Room, the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room. We all remember Jane with great affection, and I am grateful to see so many friends here today. So I thought I would begin my reading with a new book, which is really an old book. This is What Happens. And 
what happens was my first book manuscript, it was accepted by Grove Press and was in press just at the time that venerable institution was sold and the new owner cut out the poetry series. So the book fell into two parts, each of which was published, and the University of, Pre of Nebraska Press came to me and said, well, let's just put the manuscript back together and publish it as it was meant to be, and I was so glad to have that happen. So I thought I would um, read the title poem from What Happens. In Alma, Nebraska at midnight, into a spring storm the young doctor goes out. He says he is going to deliver the widow's baby. I am sitting in the parlor with my new friend, our landlady, who is painting my nails what she calls a good color. She paints her own and tells the story of the widow. Outside the window, the rosy snow comes down on the crocus. And by not telling the story of the widow, but letting it resonate for all of us to make up, I meant to catch that moment, which was one of so many moments in the many years I spent working as an artist in the schools, poet in the schools for the Nebraska Arts Council. Those were wonderful days of travel, five days in a community, often in outstate Nebraska. And this poem also comes from that experience. It's called November Night Driving. You can't find the brights, so when the deer flush from the ditch, we catch only the fists of their tails as they turn, swerve away from the front end where I sit stunned. 20 feet from their hard haunches. All day I have been following snow geese so high in masses against flat sky, only pattern can be the eye's subject. Tonight, the thud and rush of deer pulled onto pavement by legs so thin they are poles pushing boats through dark waters. Now I see them particular, clear, a near mess, uh, sorry, a near miss, buff and flesh. I was so horrified at sitting in the front seat of a pickup, and here comes this deer, and it was so close to me, and yet it was simply another event in the life of the driver. So all I could do was marshal language to push away the experience and also in some way to try to try to capture it. Okay. Um, how many of you know who Stanley Kunitz is? He's, he's a venerable poet, brilliant, funny, um, a great gardener. His most recent book is From the Garden and it's photographs of of Kunitz at nearly a hundred in his garden, bent over the flowers, and some meditations on the garden. This, the event that I describe here, took place probably 20 years ago with Stanley Kunitz at the car wash. <laughs> Just as the boy with round pink glasses takes my money and waves me into line, a voice on the radio says, what sorrow teaches. I turn up the, <clears throat> pardon me, I turn up the volume on the car speakers. As the wide felt streamers jiggle past the windscreen and over the top, he talks about dying. Like sex that informs the work of a boy in his 20s, death comes into the work of an old poet. And he is old says the announcer, whose voice rises with the music between commercials. Jets squirt soap suds around the wing vents. I daub up with a damp Turkish towel someone shoved in the door before. At talk of his father, a suicide, something metal grinds at my expensive aluminum, a flaw in the system my car passes over, then back onto the straight and narrow track again. 
just as Stanley's voice rises in joyous affirmation of fig trees and shoe lifts, and we burst out of the dark and go dripping but shining back into the city's traffic. And look, 20 years later, and Stanley's still in his garden. And death comes into the work of an old poet. Ah, well, okay. <clears throat> some, w let's revisit some poems from my book, Divine Honors, which recently has gotten a little bit lost. I didn't even bring trans, because uh, trans, which is the book that follows Divine Honors from Wesleyan, seems to be getting all the play. <clears throat> I wanted to revisit uh, this last reading of mine in the in the Heritage Room. Um, Sarah, who exists in my poems, in my earlier poems, as my daughter, and in this poem called Sarah Fledging, Sarah is making something. Sarah the maker, in this case, you'll see what she's making. Sarah Fledging. Soft feather heart, Blue jay and thrasher, an eagle's down she has gathered, each nail smoothing each barbed shaft, oiled so her fingers shine. Meadowlark and finch, cardinal, the junco, right upside up nuthatch, feather skim on teak where she dips from a bowl to chamois against afternoon chill, pulls her needle through blood spots, dried mahogany. Flutter heart of feather bowl as she shakes loose another amber and dove wet pebble from the patch by her elbow, reaches, gathers each shaft for a linen loop and waxes and ties off. Whirl, circle, and wave of feather, jackdaw, hawk, the golden swift scooping mosquitoes from the backyard lathe house. Her hands reach to steady the softening cloak. It quivers, air from the floor vent. She turns, and now she reaches for the lamp and rises. So my Sarah is making wings. This is this was the first uh, poem of Sarah's transformation I wrote, and she didn't really make these wings, but she was a maker, um, and an artist, and a speaker of many words, many many words. But here she's making wings. Sarah fledging. Have to get my Kleenex so my mother, who's been dead for years, won't. Tell me not, not to uh, avoid avoid the Kleenex that should be here. Okay, this is a, a sort of an odd poem. It's the I just remind you that the Sumerian god of poetry is a sow, is a sow, and in the middle of this kind of um, invocation, uh, you'll fi you'll find the Mad Hatter. Remember the Mad Hatter who was dri driven mad by the mercury that he used to shape the hats from Alice in Wonderland. Sow Sister. The Sow Sister in barnyard mud shifts her crinolines to one side and lifts her thigh. Sun beats on her knuckle bones. Sow Sister, Sow Sister, mind me. Not that she doesn't hear, but staggers to the far grass, staggers and sleeps, her hair drying fast, stiffening. Sow sister, psst, wake up. Past patience, I am boiling you to nonsense, your hocks and breasts bone bold, your oils melting. You must thrive, burlap sadness folded into packet statues, your cousin beaver's pelt stiffened with glue mercury into hats. Shining. Ah, no? Well, so I will tell you a story. Lie down in my wild mud, slippery and warm. Now you will hear wuffling far off in a bottle, and the heavens will open with malt. Cooked in your mouth, you'll come to know sift of slivered almonds and vanilla sugar. This story. I'm working on a new book of poems called List and Story, 
I wasn't, I was going to read you some of my catalog poems, my list poems, but they're so long. So I decided not to do it, but I thought the uh, South Sister belonged there as the uh, harbinger of the stories that I hope I'll be able to tell in the new book. Okay. And here's, um, here's Daylight Savings, Sandy Creek, Nebraska. So this is another in the traveling um, poetry teacher um, poems. And, and this traveling teacher who's coming into these communities is both respectful of the people that she meets there, but also a little bit full of herself and a little bit involved, self-involved in her own griefs and stories. And yet she's always bumping into the stories in the communities that she hears and feels compelled to tell. So Daylight Savings, Sandy Creek, Nebraska. Between shelves where I work in the dark, the librarian comes to visit. I'm a farmer, he says, bankrupt. Like many others, I say, polite, the visiting teacher. He turns pages of the new book he has come to show me with a hand minus a thumb. One book about travel he likes especially. The cover shows a high wheeler parked by a fence. I ride them, he says proudly. Another book about Nazi resistance in France shows a child with a spade. Farming, he says. I don't know how to do this job yet, he whispers, wondering about his book choices. What do I think? I think he's doing fine. Books about women, books about history, books about politics. Nicaragua, with a picture of trees on the front. On Tuesday nights after school, he's learning EMT, emergency medical training. They don't have doctors out here. No better way to give time. He's got kids, too, he says, locking up the room for lunch. In the hall, he opens a folder with pictures, broken chest, sutures, flailed lungs. Over, oh, I'm sorry, over spaghetti, I ask if he's ever afraid. Never, he says. I castrated bulls, dehorned them, the blood flying, vaccinated for a black leg. Some get the vet for all that, but I didn't. I never did. I've seen it all. In the afternoon, I teach freshmen and juniors. One, handsome with a neck hickey, surly and quiet, writes well about death. In the state hospital for a month last year, says the teacher, what can I do for him? Outside, spring raises the smell of urine from the fields. I walk through, breathing what cures. I watch the sun go down late. Next day at 8.30 class break, the librarian calls out, Sure hard to get up these dark mornings. Sure is, I say. When I was uh, given tenure at the University of Nebraska, which is not so easy to, to achieve, as many of you know, um, I was asked not to continue to do that work, the poets in the schools work, because it took me away from my office for too many days. And so I gave it up, but I've never given it up in my, in my mind or my heart or in my writing brain. Um, I thought since we were all here together, I would ask you, if, if you don't mind, to listen to a few new poems from my new book, List and Story. Now, there are none of my students here, but if they were, they would tell you that I'm a great believer in making the map for the new poems. You make a place on the page for them, and then at a later date, you smooth the edges and refine them and tuck in the odd syllables and make them perfect, or as perfect as you can. These, these poems have the rough edges and, and the extra syllables and the surfaces, but I wanted so much for you who came out on a Sunday afternoon to hear a little bit of my new work. So with your permission, I'll, I suppose you could say no. We're, <laughs> we're an intimate group here. 
Okay, this is called Generations, and you'll see some new characters in this one. Generations. Oh my God, I'm eating fish, says Anna at 22 months. At 10, she has holes in her ears, speaks German, lives in Berlin. She smiles as she rides a merry-go-round horse on my screen in full color. She is fixed, rising, wearing a camel-colored hat lined with fleece. She bought at a thrift store in the Middle West, where I live. Now she is in France. In another picture, she straddles a bench with Ava in the Paris metro. The girls are looking for the train. They are smiling. This picture is on my iPod. Where next? To the farm outside Regensburg? To a holiday house in the Alps? Wherever they go, for now they are together, sisters with their mama and papa. Tomorrow I'll buy my plot, sign the will, get ready to vacate the premises. Let them inhabit my means, my achievement, my goals, my earrings, my joy. So Anna and Ava, granddaughters. Here's a little darker poem. It's called Otelier, which is a German name. I don't know what its English equivalent is. Otelier, and then there's a colon, survivor, Otelier. The photo shows the train station in Berlin, the big sign, the marble corridor, the woman and two girls, their backs turned, consulting a schedule. Where they are standing, trains carried away, people, not cattle. The atheist who fled to America to live with two husbands, both European, neither Jewish, is on the psych floor now. At 84, her childhood has returned, that flood she spent her life escaping. Each morning she waves to lost peace. Not another pill, she says to the doctor, a good Italian who loves her. Locks and the ward. He complies. The one left behind in their luxury apartment is worried she has no telephone in her room. Their, I'm sorry, their caretaker takes care of him at home. What will become of her? She wants only not to drink, the freedom to starve. We will be left behind again, having survived in comfort those terrors, her youth. And in that poem, I'm so aware of the differences in human experience over generations, the good luck that you're born in one place in Lincoln, Nebraska, rather than another place, perhaps in Germany during the Holocaust, and how lucky we have been to be able to contemplate the comfort of our, uh, our past, and, and that some people, in spite of sharing geography, and homes, adjacent homes with us, never escape. So little effort to, to um, deal with that. This poem is called War. I, like everyone else of my generation, am obsessed with war. War. Grateful but unarmed, the soldiers hit the field. They were slaughtered, of course, like the mad ones who died years later, guns in their mouths. The husbands had been made ash. They will be scattered. Their widows are settling down with effects of property. The drapes are blowing at the windows. Probity. In winter, in winter, the driveways will be shoveled and the new shelves papered with flowers. Sickened by the funeral meats, the widows have bought new clothes to cover their bones. The news is filled with stories about victims and survivors. None wears a face we know. They are all freaks with crooked mouths and features, their heads bare. Let me take up the veil, cover my head and wail, which can do no good but waste hours. If breath is another word for soul, and the books of my people say so, when I fall, my soul will fall too. Um, hang on. Hang on just a minute, please. Here we go. OK, 
Okay, I'm working on a long series called The Spa of the Three Widows. The Spa of the Three Widows. And I thought I would just ask you to, to listen to um, three, three of those. Uh, the Spa of the Three Widows. At lunch, anyone can see, or maybe only the wife, who is draped in a black shawl, their Greek chorus, that they've lost together on the grief diet the weight of a healthy man, the one missing from each side of the patio table where they're sitting. They bend together over their burgers, chopped beef or vegetable, and salad, no wine this time, to discuss this year their husbands have taken by the hand death and have been dispatched by his tools, cancer for one, collapse for another, and for the third, a fall from the shed roof. Behind her shawl, the Greek chorus wonders about the sulfur tubs in the meadow behind the patio. A specific, says the brochure, for a bad back. Too much to carry, she thinks, listening to the widow's laugh. And here's the second one called One Widow Weeps, One Widow Weeps. Sophia wears new Mephisto sandals. They rub her foot sore over a vein, a big pain that seems to erode her calm. Later in the car, while one of us goes into the drugstore for band-aids to cover, I loosen the strap on her shoe by one notch. She is in the back seat. I am in front. She says, don't speak. Then she wails. I am a stone, silent as instructed. But when her small hand pushes between the seats, I take it and hold on. Her pain shudders between us. What will I do? I pray all the fragments of the prayers I know for the edge to dull. Artemisia returns with a bag. She unpeels tape, positions the gauze and presses, silence and tears. Then we go on to the beach. And here's the third one from the sequence called The Widow's Dance. It may have a different title, actually, now that I think about it. The waves have been flat all afternoon, the sky a dulled mirror, we have lain in the light for hours, protected by hats and towels and skirts. We have slept and talked, and now we are walking and looking down to find stones in the shapes of hearts, or those wishing stones with halos stretch front to back or up and down, or the flat ones for skipping on water. I seem to have picked up the ones most resembling fudge with stripes of coconut that we like best and buy in the shops, sweet stones to hold under the tongue. We have walked for an hour along the wet sand until the white cliff in the distance is just above us and the tide pool has filled with muscle, a swirl that pulls us hard. We hold hands and push back. In the distance, our friend, is dancing. The sun has come out and makes of this vista a dazzle, but we can see her flirting with the waves. Maybe he is there under the surface. Maybe she can see him. Or maybe she is alone, as we are, holding hands and running to join her. Okay, and I thought I would close with a little concrete poem um, from this book, All Odd and Splendid, which is my most recent new book of poems. And this is a, a, a little con shaped poem that I wrote thinking about the, the great poet A.R. Ammons, who for a long time wrote on strips of adding machine tape. The, the, the shape of the paper configuring his lines, his, his line shapes. So this is called Paper Strip. I mustn't spill over margins. This desk isn't mine to foul. I'm 
writing in ink. In fact, country, mine, white, slick, one side rigid, boundaries, nothing, organically loose to, grow in the body, or dirt, formal rigor for pen and brain. Why have I come to arbitrary limits? Everything lovely is discipline, borders, time, dedication. Okay, why did the phone ring and ring and ring in the empty house? Where are you? Fallen air from the sippy surface of the reverse? Oh, Paige, be my friend. I need you to guide my thoughts on loss exactly the opposite of absence, which I think may be death. This page filled up completely, edge to. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with me today.